Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to this course on Phonetics and Phonology Abroad Overview, NPTEL MOOC course. And we are in the last unit of this course and we have been discussing tone and intonation uh, in this unit of this course. So let us continue with our discussion of intonation. In the last lecture, uh, we talked about the acoustic properties of intonation, how uh, the F0 parameters um, how, how they're manipulated in intonation and how we use um, uh, the, the various aspects of phonetics are seen in intonation. So in this lecture, I will concentrate more on the phonology of intonation and also talk a bit about tone. So intonation can be thought of in terms of the continuous movement of pitch as well as in categorical terms. And pitch modulation involves uh, marking of prominence that is parts which are more important which we had already seen in the last lecture and breaking the pitch contour into groups which is also phrasing and we'll see that shortly. A broader definition of intonation includes loudness and segmental properties like pitch um, and length quality and all the other auditory percepts. So uh, an intonation uh, in languages like English and German prominence appears on a designated syllable so these are um, these are languages with uh, phonemic uh, stress and uh, this is not the case for all languages. Some languages it use pitch movement without the accompanying loudness, length and vowel reduction. And English and German are referred to by Beckman 1986 as stress accent languages in contrast to Japanese which is non-stress ac accent language, it is a pitch accent language where pitch movements occur with stress um, um, and whereas um, also pitch movements occur in stress, stress accent languages also, but it is not on a designated syllable. But in languages with pitch accents, uh, pitch accent languages, um, we have uh, we have pitch on the designated syllable, and that's the difference between stress accent and non-stress uh, stress accent languages. So this is a distinction that is commonly used to um, discuss how languages proper stress like English and German will be different from uh, languages like Japanese. But then there are also languages like unlike English, German or even Japanese um, which uh, languages which do not have um, stress in, in such a way that you had to test that the significant vowel reduction or their length extinctions etc. And, and in those languages stress is there but it is not um, it is not used um, in, in a way such that uh, different language different words uh, vary in where the stress occurs so in those languages uh, so th there's a difference between in the rhythm of those languages and rhythm of English and we will not go into all those details but it is um, good to keep in mind that English and German may not be uh, typical of stress accent languages. So, um, and then uh, degrees of prominence, even in a language like um, English, we have um, a stress accent in some language, in some words, and in some more prominence, and in some words, uh, secondary prominence. Uh, in an intonation language, pitch does not uh, distinguish words. Phrase level pitch patterns, which convey abstract meanings of their own, and um, uh, and English and most other European languages are intonation languages. It is typical for an intonation language to have stress. Um, the central idea here is that there is a text and a tune. Uh, the 
text is simply the words, the vowels, consonants, um, all the properties associated with segments and, um, and then there is a tune. So, the tune is the pitch pattern with which the words are said. So, uh, different tunes have different texts and, and so vice versa. So, text can also have um, the same text can also have different tunes. And um, central to the idea of um, intonation of phonology is also the idea that there are tonal auto segments. Uh, tone is like a phonological segment except that its content specifies only pitch features. For present purposes, let us adopt a simple feature system for pitch and then we can do ha have, have two, p uh, two features say plus high pitch or uh, low p um, plus high pitch or minus high pitch or plus low pitch or minus low pitch. And then um, this is a kind of uh, representation that is used uh, in the phonology to understand pitch in terms of binary uh, uh, features like high and low. So, um, uh, what we will show here is, a, is a, the idea of phonetic interpolation that is the, the pitch movements, the most significant pitch movements are the ones which are the most important parts of uh, an utterance and all the other parts are a part of the phonetic interpolation. So, we had seen in our last lecture that uh, how we have what, what we call as microprosody, consonantal perturbations. And here you see that as a result of phonetic interpolation, all those parts where you do not have any significant pitch movements, those are, the, the, those are linked from, the, you know, from one part to another part so that they are not considered as uh, for the understanding of the tune of the text. So, uh, the relative heights of the points corresponding to tones match uh, fairly well with uh, tonal category and the shape of interpolations between tones is not phonologically contrastive. So, um, the shape is not contrastive, neither is the, uh, the difference in small heights. So, those are also not contrastive. It is just a, a it is just significant changes, so high and low which are considered for um, an understanding of um, intonation. So, does it, so it is, seems legitimate not to assign phonological representation to random sequences. So, uh, phrasing, uh, we had talked about how we have, um, how speech is divided into parts and uh, those smaller components they, are called, they can also be called chunks. Uh, these chunks have been termed breath groups, sense groups, uh, tone units, tone groups, phonological phrases or international phrases. And the most obvious indicators of boundaries between intonation units um, are pauses. So, how do we know that there are chunks, that there are groups? Because we know that, because we know that there are pauses. And the longer the pause, the stronger the perceived boundary. Uh, however, it may always not always be easy to determine these boundaries. Uh, some other aspects of uh, prosody of this uh, of intonation is that the strengthening of segments at the beginning of phrases, it is called domain initial strengthening and it can be seen in various languages that the initial segments are always um, emphasized that they are pronounced properly called domain initial in the strengthening or uh, they could be lengthening etc. And then on the other hand, uh, resistance to assimilation across large boundaries. So, uh, in larger boundaries, the uh, phonological assimilation processes may be prevented. So, segments preserve identity enhancing the contrast. So, and this happens both at a syntagmatic level and a paradigmatic level. So, uh, in a sentence or in, uh, in domains uh, across uh, sentences, this can happen. In, and then there is final lengthening. Final lengthening is also a feature of intonation across languages. Final lengthening leads to an increase in the duration of segments which is different from the increase obtained by stress and accent. And then uh, there is um, the other property, the property of tone that we have not talked about so much. Um, categorical tonal contrasts at word level are characteristic of tone languages. And also there is a feature of grammatical tone 
which you don't see in languages like um, uh, Mandarin Chinese. So grammatical tone refers to tones which uh, indicate uh, some gr grammatical property like tense or aspect, etc. And um, so, and also categorical tonal contrasts are also characteristic of so-called pitch accent languages, which we have already talked about, and which may also have lexical or grammatical tone. Both Swedish and Japanese are pitch accent languages, but it's difficult to draw a dividing line between these two categories. So let's um, play um, tone uh, from Cantonese. We can see that here, the exam in the example given here, we have six levels, and we'll play the uh, different uh, tones uh, for the segmental uh, combination ma, and then we'll see, we'll hear that one is high level, one is mid level, one is low level, one is low falling, low high, or low mid. So, um, and then um, what is tone again? Tone is used um, in it is it, tone is um, in in a tone language. Pitch is used used in such a way that lexical entries of morphemes uh, uh, bear tone and they indicate different meanings and it could be just like segmental. Uh, information. So here we play Cantonese tone. C C C C C C. So um, that was um, a Cantonese tone, and uh, for C, sorry, it's on ma. And, um, and now uh, talking about Japanese pitch accent again. So we see three Japanese words here, meaning three different things: scroll, beef and Japan and then we can see that in the um, in the third uh, mora we have um, we have pitch accent so um, so we uh, we play um, actually th this is from Wikipedia we have two nice examples of um, of hashi and uh, where ex in one we have accent in the first mora and the second we have accent in the second mora I'll just play this clip from Wikipedia. These examples are meant to demonstrate Japanese pitch accent. Example 1. Hashi, meaning chopsticks with an accent on the first mora. Hashi, meaning bridge with an accent on the second mora. Hashi, meaning edge with no pitch accent. Compare. Hashi, hashi, hashi. Okay. And um, uh, syntactic functions. So syntactic structure and intonational phrasing are strongly related, but exact correspondence is not considered necessary. And intonation can be used to disambiguate in certain cases between two different syntactic structures. And um, also um, uh, in prepositional phrases, it's used for disambiguation. And uh, another important part when you talk about syntactic structure and intonation is information structure. And an important linguistic function of intonation is the marking of information structure in particular. And uh, it, to, uh, one, to express givenness, second, to the, for show the division of utterances into focus and background elements. And, um, um, and it is also a sort of a continuum rather than a dichotomy because um, as em entities are simply not given or new, and um, uh, so to, to say that something is given or something is new, and also there may be intermediate levels between the two extremes. So uh, here is an example of givenness, and uh, suppose uh, just to give you an example of givenness, what did John drink? John drank coffee. So um, in in information structure, this would be your new new information, which will uh, give you a focus, and then this is given all information and background, this or presupposition as it is called in information structure, and need not be. Uh, um, so uh, what we mean to say is that um, these are uh, these parts, the other uh, given all background description, uh, pre presupposition, etc., could also be focused and not just a uh, new information which is focused, but it's generally assumed that the uh, one which is the new information carries the focus. And then the second aspect of information structure is 
uh, as we said focus and background elements dependent on elements in a discourse which have been introduced as new and intentions of the speaker and there is a relation between focus and new information on one hand and back background and givenness on the, on the other but they are not always exclusive mutually exclusive it can the relationship can be orthogonal and uh, both of these structures represent so called narrow focus what is important is that this element is accented irrespective of its degree of givenness so if, as we said before irrespective of givenness it, uh, either john or drank or coffee could be focused and the preference to which element receives the accent that serves as focus uh, and that is that could also be language specific uh, and then uh, lad 1996 points out many languages that place uh, the focus exponent on the argument rather than on the predicate uh, another important thing when we talk about uh, intonation is um, um, biological factors so uh, carlos husenhoven has shown how um, uh, research on the different factors affecting international form uh, and also how they interact. Husenhoven claims that the form function relations are based on biological codes which are grammaticalized and these are the frequency code, the production code and the effort code and each code has effective or informational interpretations and have uh, linguistic manifestations in other languages. So, uh, what are the frequency code um, and production code and the effort code? So, um, in the, the frequency code um, is, is um, when we have um, the secondary use of the frequency code. That is what is the, fre uh, the frequency code would say that in languages we have depending on uh, whether you are asking a, a question or a statement, etc and um, so these are so th as we saw in when we are asking a question the pitch rises and when it is a statement um, it is a falling uh, intonation. So, we often find a grammaticalization uh, of the frequency code and then uh, however there also um, we also have different uh, ways of interpreting the frequency code as because there are languages which do not use the rising tone sometimes. And then we have the effort code, effort code would say that uh, more effort is, um, is put in uh, when, 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 you have to, when you have to emphasize something and then suppose uh, you know, would, you, would you like still more coffee, so would you like still more um, some, would you like some more uh, tea. So, uh, we are, um, so when we are expressing something like that, we are emphasizing on more to say, to focus there. So, and we are giving, we are, we are putting in a lot of effort to say that. And, and that would be uh, the grammaticalization of the effort code. And so, and um, th then there are examples that, uh, that we have where in a tone languages, high tones are lowered and uh, low tones are raised in negative sentences from the uh, verb onwards and um, these uh, could be uh, some, uh, it could be interpreted as um, some way of expressing the effort code. And then uh, we have, uh, we have the uh, production code. So, the pro uh, that as, as um, shown by Husenhaven that the production code says that um, uh, that to produce to say to, to express something which is um, small and not threatening etc we use a high pitch uh, but to uh, to show that something is um, uh, uh, for instance large creatures or that you are authoritative you use a sort of a lower pitch and and that that code could also be uh, grammaticalized and so that that is the uh, so uh, that is the research which uh, shows that um, the different factors affecting international form and it can also and they can also interact in the, in the grammar now we come to models of intonation and uh, 
pitch can be either captured as pitch configuration such as rise, fall, rise, fall, and so on, or as a sequence of targets. And targets specify only specific points. In the fundamental frequency contour, uh, represented phonologically as tones, and high tones uh, correspond to high targets, low tones to low targets. And these tones uh, can be combined to complex pitch accents, like LH representing a rise, and HL a fall, or boundary tone combinations, um, LH, etc. So, uh, the, what are the models of intonation? We have the British school, which uses rise and falls as primitives, and then we also have the autosegmental, which uses high and low. So, the British school um, uh, shows that uh, the most important contour is the nuclear tone, and it starts as the nucleus or nuclear syllable, and the utterance's most prominent syllable continues to the end of the phrase, and the nucleus represents only the obligatory part of the tone group. And then um, a tone group consists of a prehead and a head and a nucleus. So the prehead is the unaccented syllables before the first pitch accent, and the head is of course the uh, the first pitch accented syllable, um, uh, two including the nuclear syllable, and a nucleus, last pitch accented syllable within a tone group, tail and a tail post uh, unaccented post nuclear syllables. Now, unlike the British school with the tone uh, head, um, prehead, and mm, and um, nucleus and a tail, uh, we have uh, autosegmental metrical model, which is uh, which is currently the most widespread phonological framework for representing intonation in terms of autosegmental metrical, starting with the work of Pierre Humbert and and then in Ladd, and the division of utterances into phrases and this assignment of relative prominence two elements within the phrase represent the metrical aspect, which was first proposed by Lieberman and Prince. And the association of tones with the metrical structure is the autosegmental aspect of this model. And the term, when we say autosegmental, what does it mean? It refers to the fact that tone should be considered uh, autonomous with respect to the text. And we saw that when we looked at, um, he forgot the erasers. And that we can uh, ask as that as a question, or as a as a surprise, or as a declarative sentence, and then we can we see that the tune is autonomous of the text, and the tune can thus be re realized on a great many texts of different lengths and structures. And the greatest advantage uh, compared to the British school model is that tonal information can be precisely located. On, on single syllables and at the edge of phrases, and you do not need uh, do not need uh, entire tone groups, or it's not explained over a whole um, group of syllables. And in the British school, only direct connection connection between tones and text occurs on the nucleus, but here the connection is the connection is quite uh, direct. In most uh, autosegmental metrical models, the nucleus does not have a special status. It is simply defined as the last fully fledged pitch accent in a phrase. So that is, and, and it is, does not have uh, the status that it has in the British, British school. And a widely used autosegmental metrical framework for the description of intonation is TOBI or tone and break. And this is a system which was originally developed as a transcription system for American English that has since become a general framework for developing intonation systems. And um, again, to repeat what we have said initially, intonation is can be considered as control modulation of voice pitch. And as we initially said that you can express this as a, as a continuation or you can express this categorically. You can say that high and low tones or you can say pitch variations. So all languages seem to use at least some intonation to mark prosodic information, intonation can signal information structure, which we saw as focus and givenness, etc. And all versus new information or non-linguistic information like attitude or emotion. So this much we have studied so far. And also we have studied uh, how uh, we have seen how um, you can you can see you can say rise and falls, but doesn't tell us much about linguistic structure. And um, international contours can also be described as a string of distinct tonal elements. In other words, 
um, a contour is grammatically governed and series of pitch targets. And this is mostly in auto segmental metrical models. And each intonation is determined by three parameters, pitch accent type, pitch accent location, nuclear boundary, and phrasing. So uh, the star tone that we talked about initially, this is also the pitch accent. This is how it's shown with a star. Uh, and a, a tone sequence that aligns with a stress syllable within a phrase. So if it aligns with a stress syllable, then that is L star or H star. The syllable associated with the pitch accent is called an accented syllable. English has two pitch accents, H star, L star, and four bitonal accents, and this is from Perambert. L plus H star, L star plus H, H star plus L, and H plus L star. And a nucleus pitch accent is the last pitch accent in the intermediate phrase and is the most prominent one. The other important properties are of phrasal tones, tones associated with the edge of a phrase, not to a syllable, and then phrase accents. So also there are phrasal tones, phrasal accents. Uh, so the, those are, these are boundaries, uh, these are shown with that percent symbol, H or L persons showing boundary tones belong to, to an intonational phrase. And um, phonetics provides a mapping from these phonological elements to continuous acoustic parameters. So, and we studied, uh, we looked at it uh, in our lecture yesterday. And there are four dimensions of intonation based on Lieberman and Pierre Humbert. Uh, and what are those? As we have been repeating so far, tune is very important, prominence, stress is very important pitch range could be global uh, in the sense that um, the arise could, could show a, a question and the fall could uh, mean a, 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 de a declarative sentence or at least a phrase size a choice of pitch scaling parameters and declination downward trend in pitch across a phrase. So these are sort of uh, the dimensions of intonation that you have to consider if you're doing an intonational study. So um, pitch accent in intonation, so you can have the nuclear accent is either is the, um, uh, as we said before, the relative um, this distinct, the differences do not matter so much and um, range between um, high and low uh, is pretty um, big, but between two highs it may not be uh, very significant. It, the relative differences do not matter so much. And um, continuing with phonetic realization uh, from the last lecture, a uh, native speaker hears the accented vowel as higher than the rest, even though the maximum pitch may be in the next syllable. So those are some things that one needs to keep in mind while doing an intonation analysis. And if the word doesn't have an accent, the pitch rises continuously from a low at the start of the word to a high at its end. And uh, some things that we can do while um, uh, studying intonation, that is we use a software called Prat. We locate, uh, we do pitch tracking using Prat the, uh, and, and we find out uh, how the pitch is changing using the, um, the, the various uh, uh, tools provided in, in Prat. And um, so we use the computer pitch tracking and the, the pitch tracking algorithms. Uh, they do some autocorrelation. So, and then there are other things to consider there. There are pitch tracking errors, there are pitch halving, there could be pitch doubling. And all these are problems. Um, and then uh, when you're using Prat, uh, many people use Prat to, use, um, to understand uh, or look at intonation. And these are some things to keep in mind. And then um, uh, when we're discussing intonation, a uh, couple of things um, that come into uh, play is that when you're doing a toby, um, that is tone and break in this is, it's, it's, we have to remember that it's a system of prosodic labeling that capture prosodic events in an utterance. So um, when we're doing a Toby uh, labeling, uh, the pr we have to keep in mind that prosodic events fall um, into two categories. And, and one is pitch-related events that mark some syllables as more salient than others, and pitch-related events or patterns that mark phrasing. So as we have been repeating, 
the pitch related events um, where we mark prominence and phrasing. So these are two important things. While uh, if we consider using Toby la labeling for intonation. So these are from Toby guidelines available for free. Um, Toby has a tone tier, an orthographic tier, and a break index tier, and a miscellaneous tier. And then there is a eight star uh, peak, peak accent, as we have already talked about this. It's the accented syllable. That is a stress syllable, which gets the pitch accent, and it will be called the peak accent with, with H star. And then, um, uh, as we had seen initially when we when, when we're looking at Hayes, Hayes 2009, uh, they had included in pitch in the middle range. Here in the Toby labeling, we do not use pitch in the middle range, and it is um, uh, it uses relatively high pitches, excludes the low F0 targets. Um, F0, so a fundamental frequency which is very low is not can never be H star. And then um, L star is low accent. And then there are phrasal tones, which are L or H phrase accent. This is how they are represented with a dash. And then we have boundaries, which are shown in the percentage L star or H star. And we have a high initial boundary can be shown with a percentage H and marked, uh, it marks a phrase that begins relatively high in the speaker's pitch range. And the default initial boundary is in the middle range or lower and will be left, so almost always left unmarked in transcription. And for a full intonation phrase with the L phrase accent ending its final intermediate phrase and L boundary, tone for a link to a low point, and this is a standard declarative contour of American English. Then we have LH percent. And again, this is um, the, the, this is the last intermediate phrase followed by H. So this is a continuation rise, and we'll play the uh, a sample for you. And then we have H H percent for intonation phrase with final intermediate phrasing phrase ending in H phrase continue accent and subsequent H boundary tone, and it is a canonical yes no question contour. And note that the H phrase accent causes up step on the following boundary tone, and then we have H L percent for intonation phrase in which the H phrase of the final intermediate phrase up steps the L percent to a value in the middle of speaker's range producing a final level plateau. So HL percent is actually a plateau. And both H, H percent and HL percent are the, is a result of up steps. And um, scooped accent is the one where you have a low tone target on the accented syllable but followed by a sharp rise. And then we have the rising. So note that there is a difference between L star plus H and L plus H star. We have a rising peak accent, a high peak target on the accented syllable, which is immediately preceded by a sh relatively sharp rise from a valley in the lowest part of the speaker's range. And then finally, we have um, H plus H plus um, the, the exclamation mark. Um, uh, so it, this is a uh, this is a step into a step down into the accented syllable from a high pitch which itself cannot be, so this exclamation mark showing that there is a down step of the following H percent, so of, sorry, of the following H, start H. So H pitch accent in the same phrase and should be only used in the preceding material is clearly high pitch and accented. So sorry, clearly high pitch and unaccented and then causes a down step in the following uh, accented high. So, and also these are the things that is important for Toby labeling, uh, break indices and uh, values for the break index R, so zero for um, clitic groups, etc. Uh, and then one for phrase medial boundaries, word boundaries, and then two for a strong disjuncture, and three for immediate intonation phrase boundary, and four for full intonation phrase boundary. For example, a typical fluent utterance of a following uh, utterance sentence, do you want an example, might have a zero between uh, did you, so did you, something like that, and and then uh, and wanton, again, sh between the two, there may be very little break, so it can have a zero, and, and uh, then the remaining break index would probably, values would probably be one between you and want, and, uh, and an example. 
indicating the presence of a mere word boundary and four at the end of the utterance indicating. So, um, oh, here's an utterance that we'll play now before we end this lecture, which will show that, um, will show the, uh, the, the prominent parts will be very clear and then the two international um, uh, phrases will also be very clear, the gap between the two parts. So, playing it now. Armani knew the millionaire. So, uh, the sentence is Armani knew the millionaire. So, um, this is, um, uh, you can see the gap. So, showing that this is two international phrases as we talked before, the more gap you have showing that there's strong breaks between two parts. And then as we can see the L plus H percent here, sorry L plus H star here, star uh, is located to the, is, is aligned to the, um, to the prominent syllable here again in millionaire, uh, again so this H star on the prominent syllable. And again all of these, Armani knew the millionaire, they're all pitch accented and the, there are two IPs here. So the acoustic correlates mark prominence, that is high um, pitch, and groupings are typically the F0 pattern, uh, perceived pitch pattern and the relative duration. The contributions of other cues such as amplitude, voice quality, pausing, strength of articulation, etc., they are all there. And then in the, uh, the tone shows phrasing and prominence, the break index here captures primarily phrasing and other grouping information. And so, um, and then the example that you saw is straightforward and context independent. And um, so, and then they miss a considerable amount of information. We don't know how uh, those, uh, those sentences were produced. But again, we'll play another sentence here before we wrap up, um, which shows a basic prosodic pattern in a short utterance. He was nominated. So again, this was he was nominated. So uh, showing the most um, important stressed part here is um, uh, showing nominated and then a final L, L person showing the boundary and then um, these are the most important uh, parts in the sentence. Also, you uh, sh sh notice that we have one, uh, one, one for both as um, the boundary between these two words. Similarly, um, for here, again, we have uh, new the millionaire. There is one uh, between new the and between Armani and next part, we have four because there are two IPs. So, um, this has three words and it produces a single international phrase with one pitch accent. And as mentioned above, the tone tier marks two types of events and these are associated with accented syllables and with phrasing. And then we have falling and the other international event that is labeled in a Toby transcription is the falling F0 at the end of the utterance and the low pitch re region is marked with LL person whereas the L indicates that there's a low phrase accent that is followed by low boundary tone on the final syllable. And again, uh, like all intonation contours, as we know about tune and text, so they can be produced as um, on many, the, the, the tune can be produced on many strings. And then another example is Mariana won it, single intonational phrase, one pitch accent, and the pitch accent is H percent, and the phrase accent boundary tone is LL percent. So this is the sentence. Mariana won it. Uh, so the sentence is Mariana won it, and then um, so where um, we have one one between the break in this is between one and it is only one, and this is the strongest break of four. So the break index marks the level of disjuncture between the words, and uh, intonation is one of the acoustic cues to a disjuncture and. Um, between LL percent uh, boundary tone signals, the maximal level of disjuncture um, is, so this is four as we, show, as we saw it in all the sentences there. If, if there are two IPs in a sentence, uh, even if it sounds like one sentence, Armani, uh, break, and then the rest of the sentence. And other uh, boundaries are marked with smaller break indices. For example, typical word boundary and fluent sentence of words within a phrase are marked as 
one. And then um, there are levels of intermediate phrasing uh, between intuitional phrases that are marked with break indices 2 or 3. 0 is where, where the um, is reserved for case when two words are produced or the boundary between them is intermediate. And uh, we have here with uh, a 0. He said you would. So um, he said you would. So here between said and you, uh, there is very little boundary because um, uh, typically um, uh, the uh, the following uh, pronoun is almost like um, is like uttered like a, one word, and um, this, to summarize um, the inventory that we have seen so far, uh, tones, H star, pitch accent, and uh, L L person low phrase accent, and uh, low boundary tone, and then um, break in this is zero for word boundary apparently so which is almost erased one typical between word juncture between a, in a phrase and end of an international phrase is four. So with this we saw how we can do Toby labeling. Here all the uh, the pictures that you saw are from Pratt even though we just mentioned Pratt which is a software free downloadable software where you can do a lot of analysis of pitch, acoustic analysis etc. Uh, we did not introduce, uh, we did not discuss Pratt a lot in this uh, course and uh, maybe uh, another one, but it's very useful for even for the studying of you know, intonation um, and looking at pitch contours, seeing the breaks between words, etc. And uh, these tiers can all can also be marked in uh, in those in, in by using softwares like Pratt, which allows you to create different tiers for um, words in a in a sentence and um, also we saw that we can very easily see uh, prominence, the acoustic um, uh, prominence lend by, the, like pro by properties of F0 and duration etc which are very clearly seen in the sentences that we uh, played for you here and uh, we can see Armani and then Millionaire. So where you have high pitch showing the prominent syllable. And that brings us to the end of this lecture on intonation and um, also th uh, the end of this course. And we will interact with you um, in the, if you have questions, etc., when you are doing this course. Thank you for your attention.